let's explore the mechanics and inner workings of a reflecting telescope. A reflecting telescope consists of a long tube with a curved mirror at the bottom that collects and reflects the incoming light and converges it at the telescope's focal point. But what happens to the rays of light from here on out depends on the focal design of the reflecting telescope. Let's first look at the Newtonian reflector, the most common focal type, which places a secondary mirror just before the natural focal point of the converging rays of light. This secondary mirror reflects the light out of the telescope and towards the eyepiece. It is in this short distance between the secondary mirror and the eyepiece that the light rays can converge at a focal point and diverge again into the ocular lens. This position of the focal point helps determine the focal length of the primary mirror. In addition to the Newtonian focus, there are several other designs for reflecting telescopes. The schmidt cassegrain or simply Cassegrain focus reflects light off of a primary mirror at the bottom of the tube onto a secondary curved mirror, which then redirects the light directly through a hole that's been cut into the middle of the primary mirror so that it can go into the eyepiece. A Nasmith or Coudet focus reflects the incoming light off of not one, not two, but three mirrors. And lastly, we have the prime focus of the telescope, which shows you exactly where the light will converge if there is no secondary lens. But why bother having so many designs for reflecting telescopes? Well, there are benefits to each. The Coudet focus can redirect incoming light rays immediately into a lab for further analysis without having to attach the equipment directly to the telescope or even be monitored by an astronomer. The Cassegrain focus allows for heavy instruments necessary for data reduction to be attached directly onto the telescope near its center of mass so that it remains balanced. In the Newtonian focus, the eyepiece can be easily attached in a convenient spot away from the path of light by redirecting the light out of the tube rather than putting the eyepiece in it. So how does the primary mirror of a reflecting telescope go from this to this to this. The reason why these mirrors are constructed in this order is because reflecting telescopes use what we call first plane mirrors. In a first plane mirror, light is immediately reflected off of the reflective surface on the side of the incoming light. In this type of mirror, the light rays cannot penetrate through the reflective coating and enter the glass behind, so we have an immediate reflection. In a second plane mirror, like the ones we use in the house, light approaches the mirror from the uncoated side, meaning that it must pass through the glass to reach the reflective coating in the back. But it doesn't work like this. Instead, this is what actually happens. The light gets refracted, and not once, but twice. First as it enters the glass, and then again when it's leaving the glass after being reflected off the coating in the back. Now compare this reflection off of a first plane mirror, which can reflect upwards of 95% of the incident light upon it, to this reflection off a second plane mirror, which is only 80-85% to 85 effective. So why do we use glass to build the bases for the mirrors used in reflecting telescopes? Well, metal expands and contracts too much, and in extreme weather conditions like some of these telescopes will have to endure, this is not ideal. A cement base is too porous and cannot be made smooth enough for the telescope to produce clear images. And wood is all too susceptible to environmental wear and tear and can expand, rot, crack, and dry in less than ideal conditions. But glass can be shaped easily, is very hard, can be polished down extremely smooth, and it doesn't expand or contract the way metal would with changes in temperature. So glass is perfect for this purpose. Here we can see some examples of reflecting telescopes. Notice that the telescopes have larger apertures than the previous refractors, but their lengths do not have to be so big since the light is allowed to bounce back and forth several times in the body of the telescope. Some are relatively large nonetheless, but you can appreciate how much more compact this telescope is than a refractor with the same light gathering ability, objective lens size, would have to have been. Now, a very famous reflecting telescope is the Hubble Space Telescope, which has been orbiting the Earth since it was first launched on April 24, 1990. With a primary mirror of diameter 2.4 meters, the Hubble has made over 1.3 million observations since it began its mission in 1990. Its mirror is nested inside the body of the telescope, 
which continues its low Earth orbit around the Earth every 95 minutes, powered by its solar panels on either side. When it is not actively observing celestial objects, its aperture door is closed to protect the optics of the telescope. Here it is the moment that it was released from the Space Shuttle Discovery on April 25, 1990, and while it did make observations during its first three years in operation, it wouldn't be until January 13, 1994, that the spherical aberration problem in its primary mirror would be fixed in the first servicing mission, finally resulting in images with much higher resolution and clarity than before. Before the launch of space-based telescopes, we were still building larger and larger reflectors here on the ground. This is the mirror base for the 200-inch Hale Telescope, now at Mount Palomar Observatory in San Diego, California, and the irregularities in the Pyrex glass are quite evident. But notice that the glassmakers used a honeycomb pattern in the base to ensure low weight and high stiffness. The glass needed to be finely ground and immaculately polished. Until it looked like this so that when the reflective coating was added, no imperfections would jeopardize the performance of the telescope. The 200-inch is still in use today at Mount Palomar and is regularly maintained, looking fresh with a new coat of aluminum after a deep clean. But as is the case with all telescopes, there is a limit to how big they can be made. The cost of producing mirrors that are increasingly larger in size than the previous record holder are too high and the complications too many. So a good way to compromise is to build two slightly smaller mirrors that work together in tandem, effectively operating as a single primary mirror that is larger than either of the two. One such example is the Large Binocular Telescope at Mount Graham International Observatory near Tucson, Arizona. Each of the individual mirrors which are mounted on the same base have a diameter of 8.3 meters. Another great example is the Twin Keck Telescopes at Keck Observatory in Mauna Kea, Hawaii. You may notice the honeycomb design in the open dome on the right in this image. This diagram shows the relative sizes of the primary mirrors of notable optical telescopes. We already discussed the Yerkes Telescope, the Great Paris Exhibition Telescope of 1900, the Hale 200-inch Telescope, the LBT, the Twin Keck Telescopes, and of course the Hubble. Some of the other telescopes included in this diagram are either currently under construction or proposed for future projects.